So I'm Eli. I'm Caitlin. Yeah, and we are the Martinez's. <laughs> We're both married, are married to each other, I should say. Uh, so a little bit about myself is I currently, my current job is working in the United States Air Force as a supply technician. Uh, my main section that I work in is uh, customer support. So I deal with uh, a lot of uh, what we call customers or maintainers ordering aircraft parts. Uh, we're both originally from Houston, Texas, and we're high school sweethearts, and Dover was our first station. Yes, and um, I'm a medical assistant at Dedicated to Women OBGYN. I grew up in the church, uh, knowing, like, I guess, being born into Christianity, so to say. Uh, my family would uh, always bring us and drag us to church as children, and, you know, it was always one of those, oh, do I have to go kind of things. So I grew up in the church. I was very familiar with the stories, the, the different teachings and everything like that. I wasn't, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like I wasn't like uh, drawn away from it as a child. I was always kind of like forced to do so. But um, growing up, of course, like I started to deviate some of the ways. I began to do things that were not the right things to do. Uh, I had like a, my parents were divorced, got divorced, and that created like a trauma in my childhood. And I seeked myself, at, at, like both identity and peace, and like video games and different things of this world. And ultimately, none of those things would ever satisfy that hunger to find my purpose of who I am and what I need to do. Um, for me, a big pivotal point in my walk in Christianity and in my faith was coming here to Dover actually. It was uh, when we came to Calvary, it was the pivotal point when I decided to make Jesus not only my savior, but my Lord. And I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of us tend to kind of get confused because I had that confused for 21 years, you know, like 20 years. And the change has been so crazy. And what I mean by that, like, it's really finding that inner desire to find and follow Christ. And I think that's where I'm at now, is continuing to grow. So my story of coming to know God and coming to know Christ, uh, at a very young age, I grew up in the church, a very strict church. And my parents took me all the time, just like Eli. I had no choice, but I also wasn't upset about it. It was just kind of my lifestyle and what I knew and I was so young at the time I also thought everybody did it um, but later on a few years down the road my parents ended up divorcing and that really hurt me that created a lot of pain and loneliness in my life and it sent me like into a really bad depression but all throughout that in middle school I ended up going back to church, but I was still felt lonely and I still didn't really know God's love for me and know His plans that He had for me. And in high school is when I kind of made the decision that I need to take it seriously. Like this is life or death. This is eternity with Him or not. And when we moved here to Dover in like 2017, we, that was also my pivotal moment of like, now I'm making him my Lord and I'm making him the head over my whole life, not only my life, but our marriage as well. And that's kind of where we're at now. It's just finding ways to grow deeper and finding ways to be able to seek him more and bring others to know him as well. I'm going to get right into it. Our, our first night is what I want to do here is set a foundation for why we would even grow spiritually. What is the reason for growing? And I think it's important that we begin this way because I, I heard a quote one time from a pastor that said, messy theology leads to messy living. In other words, a messy study of God or not knowing God the way we should 
could lead to very messy living. And so it's important that we have a strong understanding of what growth is all about and why would we need to grow spiritually? Um, because you've probably heard it in Christianity. Hey, are you growing? What are you doing to grow? Are you doing these, these things to grow? And so the, the emphasis on spiritual growth actually really does come uh, loud and clear in scripture. Um, and really the Christian faith puts an emphasis on spiritual growth because it's part of God's plan for mankind. And that's what I wanna unpack tonight is that spiritual growth is part of God's plan for mankind. And the first step to any of us growing is that we first have to be saved. The reason why that's the case is because, well, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ, what are you actually growing to be? If you come to church and you fill the pew and you go to church every week and you do that, are you really transformed yet or are you just an attender of church? So there's, there's really an identity shift that happens when we become a believer in Christ. And so the first step to growing is understanding that, well, you have somewhere you need to grow. Okay, you have to understand that you're not who God has intended you to be and now you have to become who you're supposed to be. What am I referring to? Well, I'm referring to the garden. I'm referring to how sin just jacked everything up. It, it didn't go the way that you know, God wanted it to go um, because of man's free will. We, we made some choices that were poor and it interfered and affected uh, really God's plan for mankind. So I wanna go to Ephesians two. Would you open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter two? And I just want you to know this week, uh, we want the Holy Spirit to just move and, and just, just think like we're in a big giant Bible study right now. Okay, so we're sitting down, we're just studying scripture together and we're looking through these notes and I gave you a lot of notes. I didn't give you any fill-ins because I didn't want you to have to worry about uh, filling a bunch of stuff in or, or writing things. I wanted you to be able to hear and receive what you need to receive tonight and this week. And I'm very excited about tomorrow night where Jody unpacks some things for us as well. But let's go to Ephesians chapter two. It's in the New Testament. And we're gonna to go to uh, verse one, just to get an idea of really where we are without Christ and how we have to be, what I'm gonna share with you tonight a little bit is being reborn and made new. Now I wanna say this as well, that if you feel like you've already have grown, like you feel like, okay, uh, I was, we were joking in the lobby. I was joking in the lobby with someone. But like, let's say you're 65 or 70. Why am I here, right? I'm, I, I'm, it's too late, right? No. Every time I teach or preach, you know my mantra, right? You know what I say. You don't just take this for yourself. You take this for the people you're ministering to, okay? So, and by the way, everyone, no matter how old we are, still have growing to do. We're not perfect until the day we pass. And so I just want you to know that if you have already heard all this tonight, take notes for that person you're helping become a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. So Ephesians 2, verse 1. Once you were dead, so at one time you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers, in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, so notice the past tense, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and by the way, I'm, I'm reading the New Living Translation, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. Notice what I just, just read there. 
for those of us who, uh, who are continuing to grow, you are an example of the grace and kindness that God has shown towards you. You're an example for the lost. So in other words, sometimes we, uh, we're afraid of what people are going to think because they know our past. Don't be afraid of that. In fact, be willing to show the world what Jesus has done in your life bec- in spite of your past. So let your, let your past be a story of God's power in your life. That's what he's saying here. The church of Ephesus has been an example of God's kindness and grace. It's awesome. And he goes on to say in verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. Notice the condition. We're saved by grace when we believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. You know why we can't take credit for what Jesus did for us? Because we didn't go to the cross, only he did. We did not do any work to be saved, but we did believe we did have to come to a moment of receiving Christ as our salvation. Salvation is not a reward. This is so important to get tonight. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. In other words, we can't do anything to receive salvation. We can't do anything to be worthy of being died for. He did that when we thought we were, like, when we were just sinners, he did that. And when we think we're not worthy, he says you are worthy. Tonight in this room, we're doing a little bit of spiritual battle. I just want you to be aware of this. Because there may be someone in this room who really wrestles with understanding and grasping, does God truly love me? Has Jesus Christ truly died for me? And if there's no one in this room, please understand this. One of the biggest things I deal with in helping people grow spiritually is the very word faith or believing that he even has done all that he's done for us. It's like because we're removed 2,000 years from the event and then we have to believe that some cross and a guy on it with blood doesn't work, but he does. We begin to question the work of Christ for us What is that? That's the enemy attacking us. That's us just not grasping the amazing grace that he was willing to do that for us. So I know in this room tonight, possibly there could be some in here who have really been wrestling whether am I really loved? Have I really been accepted by God? And I'm praying tonight that God takes care of that in your heart tonight. So lastly, he says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So because of sin's damage on mankind, we must be redeemed and renewed by the life of Jesus Christ. And just know that being redeemed or saved is instant. When we gave our life to Christ, it instantly made us a a different person. We were positionally in a different place spiritually with God. And then the renewing of our minds, the renewing and spiritual transformation, well, that's a lifelong process. The reason why this is important to understand is because a lot of us think that by the next day after salvation, we're going to be like done with everything, right? No. I mean, even if we stop sinning, guess what's still next after we stop sinning? Putting on the new nature, putting on the new habits of Jesus Christ. So we may stop sinning overnight, even though none of us have. We're all guilty of that. But we still have to do what? We still have to become more like Christ. So that this ex- expectation on us, and I'm, I'm speaking to teenagers tonight too and youth, this expectation that you're supposed to be perfect the next day is not realistic. And God knows that so much that he gave you his, his son, he gave you his spirit, he gave you the word, Paul taught taught the church many times to get get rid of those things in your life. In other words, God expected that you're going to need some help. You're going to need some training wheels, so to say. You know, does anyone ride training wheels back in the day? Everyone do that? Yeah. I was ready to get those things off. But you can see in this scripture, in Ephesians 2, how we once were, because before Christ, that's how we were. But then by his grace, through faith, we have been saved. And I love even this in verse 10, that, the, that God has a plan for us. That God has a plan to take you from, from a mess who used to be like 
a child of this world, you know, a, a victim of, of sin, and now you're supposed to be able to do good works? Some of us can't even see that in ourselves, can we? Well, I'm here to tell you right now, you may not think that you can do that, but Jesus in you can do good works. All right, I'm going to keep going. I'm getting excited about that. Look at, I'm going to give you some more scripture of how, how we know we need to grow. And uh, we're going to talk about being born again. John 3, 3, Jesus replied to Nicodemus, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. We're reborn by the spirit when we believe in Jesus. So in a sense, that's why we call people babes in Christ. You know, that's why, you know, I'm a baby Christian. That's kind of the word we've given in Christianity to people. And, you know, it's interesting because naturally a baby grows up, right? Well, I got to tell you one, th- one story about that. I am so glad my kids grew up. Like, grew up. We had a diaper genie. Do you guys know what a diaper genie is? Okay, a diaper genie is this like plastic container thing that you push your foot on, the lid comes up, and you throw dirty diapers inside this plastic, long plastic bag. And like you stuff the diaper in there, okay? And then it closes and it seals up the odor so your house doesn't smell like death, you know? Like dead food, decomposing food. So I, um, well, I tried to see how much I could save money on because those things are expensive. Like the bags that go in there are so expensive. And so I tried to stuff this thing so much. Well, my wife was like, honey, I can't get any more diapers in there. Can you please change the bag inside this diaper genie? So I'm going in there and first of all, the smell hit me in the face so hard. I couldn't breathe. And uh, so I go in there, I open it up and I, and I tie the top and I'm pulling it and it just keeps coming out. It's just like this. And by the time I'm done, it's like from here, like halfway through the steps is this long line of, of diapers. I don't even know how that was possible. But let me tell you, I wanted to throw a party the day that my kids had potty trained. Can I get an amen, amen from any parent in here? Thank God that we naturally grow. So happy about that. The thing is, is just the same way physically or in, natural, in the natural world we grow, in the spiritual world we're supposed to grow because a babe doesn't stay a baby he or she whole life, right? His or her whole life. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, another proof text that you're a new creation. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Well, that's interesting. Have you ever started a new job and you were perfect at it? Have you ever got a new assignment and you knew exactly what you were doing and, and you didn't have to learn anything? You were like, you were a mature adult in that job? No, we, we were babes, so to say, or we were rookies or green in that career, and we had to learn. So you see there uh, why the need, again, is that there's growth that's going to happen. It's, it's expected. Now, I can't believe that my wife and I have even raised two kids. Uh, seven years old, my daughter's seven, my daughter uh, and my son is 10. And looking back, I'm like, how did we do that? Can I tell you guys another diaper story? (laughs) I gotta be careful when I drink my water. I might go everywhere. Um, So my wife, uh, well, Connor, Connor has has a big head, uh, like his daddy, and uh, and um, so we had to have a C-section, and uh, my wife was bedridden for three days because she was in labor for almost 24 hours. I want to say. And actually, I told the nurses in the middle of the night, like at four in the morning, I was like, hey, I think it's time to like consider other options because this, we've been pushing forever and my legs were hurting. (laughs) Every nurse looked at me with daggers in her eyes when I said that. Yeah. Well, I didn't think about diaper changing when the babies came out of mommy's womb and I had never changed a diaper. And when it was time for me to change diapers uh, on Connor, um, I was like, hey, you know, Rachel, the, oh, she's asleep and she's bedridden. Who's going to change the diaper? 
I kid you not, for three days straight, I changed every single diaper of Connor's when he was three, just three days old, those first three days, I changed every diaper. I stepped up, right? I stepped up, I did it. I saw those nasty diapers, yeah. Wow. That was a new experience. But then later on, it was like I was the one to change diapers because I had the, the routine down, you know? I, had, I could get it done in seconds, you know? So you learn, okay, I gotta get off the diaper stuff, but you learn to grow, right? We know this, John 1, 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It doesn't say adults. Now, of course, he's referring to all his children, whether they're adults or not. But children born not out of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So again, we're being born into this new life. We're a new creation. We're being adopted into the family of God. And I remember when my brother and, and uh, Jen, they adopted T Taylor and Tyler. And it, they had to teach them how to live in their kind of house. And God has house rules. And God has a way for us to live. And, and it's nothing we can really negotiate. Our world wants to negotiate that. The world wants to negotiate what God wants uh, them to do. In other words, the world wants to tell God what we should be able to do. But the reality is we're adopted into the family of God by his grace, spared from death, called into living a life like his son Jesus, so we instead should submit ourselves to what he has for us. Am I right? So there's things that we're supposed to learn now that we're in the family of God. We didn't learn those things overnight. And I think you guys get the point of where I'm saying. In other words, we really do need to grow. We really cannot go, I'm over the line of salvation, I'm good. There, there, is, there is no area in scripture that shows us that once we step over a line of salvation, okay, and we, we, we said a prayer to God, or maybe we were at a church play, or maybe on a Sunday morning service, or a friend's house, we really need to help those people we lead to Christ to know what to do next. My mom calls it, if we don't help them, my mom calls it spiritual abortion. When we're leading someone to Christ and we let them try to fend for themselves, it's like keeping a baby in a bassinet and saying, feed yourself, grow yourself, get the food on your own. That's not possible. I mean, I've met with people who have no idea how to even navigate a Bible, and yet we do it, hopefully, every day or at least on a regular basis, right? And so people need someone to come alongside them because they're babes in Christ. They don't know Jesus. They don't even know what all took place on the cross. They just know that they're supposed to believe. And so, by the way, sometimes, I'm going to be completely transparent with you, sometimes people that have already prayed a prayer for salvation actually still didn't re realize what they were doing. And you had to help them understand what happened, and they actually then come across that line, so to say, and they're changed. So sometimes we are going to lead people to Jesus when they fully understand what's going on. So salvation is being made new by Christ. Sanctification is the process of maturing and becoming more like Christ. So I want you guys to know the difference there. So the moment, there's a moment in salvation where there's a spiritual transaction between, between us and God. We call that salvation or regeneration, okay, to be regenerated. But then there's this process after that that we call spiritual transformation, okay? So once salvation takes place, the next thing is sanctification or spiritual transformation. Sanctification means to be holy, and it's a lifelong process. This is why I really, really, really preach and teach that we have to be patient with new believers. That because, because they haven't learned much you know, they haven't really grasped all that is taking place in their lives and all that Jesus did for them, all that God asked of us. They haven't really grasped all that. So we have to be careful about expecting them to be um, like Pastor Kuhn overnight. 
right? That'd be great, but that's just not the reality. So what's God's plan to grow us? That's, that's important then. I, I wanna put this out there to you guys, that God actually is growing you. Isn't that cool? Like God is actually cultivating and watering and fostering growth in you. And he has a goal. Like every good transformation plan, there has to be a goal. There has to be a goal. And uh, the goal is the completion. And the goal for us is God wants to transform us into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Look at this scripture, Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. Those he decided long ago, so to say, to be like Jesus. So before you were even saved, God chose for you to become just like Jesus. That's huge to me. That's huge to me because now I know where I'm headed. I do not like going on trips with no GPS. I don't, I'm not that kind of guy who goes, hey, let's just see where the wind takes us, you know? Let's see how far our easy pass can get us. Not very far. No, it's pretty far. So here again is, uh, is this child part coming in. Excuse me. And it says this, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So again, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, who is Jesus, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You know what that means? Jesus is kind of like our big brother. Isn't that cool? He's like the first brother in the family. He's, he's, the, he's the elder in the family. And uh, he's a prototype. He's a blueprint for who we're supposed to be. So every single person that is just kind of transformed by God is supposed to be like Jesus. He is the blueprint for everything about us. Again, that gives us a laser focus on who we're supposed to be. And that's the goal and plan that, that God has for us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Rachel Tootin was reading this as we were singing Glory to Glory, powerful verse. So all of us who have had that veil removed because of salvation can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. You know what that, that, that says? You can't really truly see God until you first believe him. And when you believe and have that faith, that veil is removed so you can see God and see his glory. And that's why a lot of people won't understand you as a Christian. They won't understand why you go to church and worship. Why do you have your hands up? Why do you get into worship like that? Why do you give all these things? It's because you, you've believed in God first and so now you see God and you see him working in your life. And the reason why is because God has given his spirit in you so you can connect with him and have his help. So it goes on to say, and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So we see here that the Holy Spirit, which we receive to salvation, is the change and growth agent within us. I think that's huge. Colossians 3.10, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. How good is God that he has given us all of that to help us follow him? That we have the life of Jesus as our aim for how we ought to live and what we should believe. And Jesus was the greatest example of what it means to be a child of God and how we should even behave in the family of God. And if there was anyone that I would aspire to be, it would be Jesus, wouldn't it? If there was anyone that I'd be willing to follow, it would be Jesus Christ. It also makes sense then, and you can write this verse down, you don't have it in your outline, I don't think, but 1 John 2, 6. It makes sense why John would write this. In, uh, 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So again, uh, you're not supposed to compare yourself with the person next to you. You're not supposed to compare your Christian walk with the person right next to you. You're actually supposed to look at Christ and go, how am I doing? If we look at each other, 
we're never going to get to where we're supposed to be. Think about that for a second. If I compare myself to another human being who is still flawed and makes mistakes, I am actually aiming low of who God wants me to be. I'm called to aim towards Christ. I'm called to fix my eyes, as Hebrew says, fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, right? And if he's the one that initiated my relationship with God, if he's the one that created me to be who I am, should I not then fix my eyes on him as well since he's the perfecter of my faith? It's so important we grasp that tonight. So we know the goal then is to be like Jesus. But how? How do we be like Jesus when we are who we are? How does Ryan be more like Christ? Well, wait, there's good news again. God has given us the power to grow. I wrote in my notes here, God doesn't expect us to change without helping us. He doesn't expect us to change without helping us. Look at this verse, Philippians 2, 13. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. For God is working in you, giving you desire and the power to do what pleases him. Isn't that awesome? He is inside of you, working in you from the day you were saved on, his spirit is helping you be who you're supposed to be. Can we go to Romans chapter eight? We have time to go there. I want us to, to look at this scripture as well. So after the book of Acts, there's Romans. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans chapter 8. The, the life of the Spirit in us is so important for us to know. And I, I just really want us to grasp in this. I want you, as we read this together, I want you to see what the Holy Spirit is doing for your behalf. I want you to look at what God is doing for you through his spirit. And I just, I just want you to be encouraged tonight. Like there's no reason why we have to go back to our old life. I mean, he's given us the Bible. He's given us Jesus as our example. He's already done the work for us on the cross. He's given us his Holy Spirit to equip, to encourage, to convict, to correct. I mean, this is huge. And the work that the Holy Spirit does in us is bigger than we realize. If there's a prayer we could pray today, it would be, God, give me awareness of your spirit working in my life. Help me to see what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. Help me to be receptive and sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is wanting me to do right now in this moment as I'm at work. If we could do that, if we could tap into what God is doing, it would be so important. So Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Well, that's very encouraging. God is not condemning us because we belong to Christ Jesus. He's not uh, going to destroy us because of our sin. He's actually has pardoned our sin. Okay, he's not shaming you of your sin. He's not showing it to you and saying, hey, you are terrible. He's not doing any of that. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit that has set you free from the things that you were not able to set yourself free from. Uh, there's a word I was supposed to give you guys tonight, and I'm just, I think I need to just go ahead and do it now, and it's going to come up again. But we are not okay because of our works. We're okay because of the work of Christ. We are not okay because of our works of being good and doing right. We're okay because of the work of Jesus Christ. So students to adults know this. The pressure is not on you to be saved. The work and the pressure was put on Christ through those nails that went through his hands and feet. That's why he was excruciating and excruciating pain even leading up to the cross in, the, in prayer in the garden because the pressure was on him to take all of our sin upon him and do what is right to obey his Lord, to obey God. He obeyed his father and went to the cross and died for us. It's not up to our works that make us righteous. 
It's what Jesus did for us that makes us righteous. So if we continue to do works to make us feel good with God, we're doing it in vain. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the Bible says. Now, does that mean we can continue to go on sinning because freely, because of what he did for us? No, and we're about to talk about that and more so this week. But I want you to know that you're not saved because of what you've done. You're saved and forgiven because of what he's done. And that's extremely important that you hold on to that in your life and especially as you talk and mentor to people. So let me keep going. Uh, The law, uh, I'm sorry, let's go to verse two again. The life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So the law, the, the, the Ten Commandments themselves had no power to save us if we obeyed them. So God provided his son Jesus to give us his spirit and to forgive us and to give us his spirit to obey him. Keeps going. So God did not what did what the law could not do. He sent his son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. So if you're in this room tonight and you feel controlled by sin, that is not of Christ. That is not at all uh, what he intended for you. He intended you to be set free from that control of sin. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied or uh, fully yeah, satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Notice there's an active uh, responsibility on our part to follow the Holy Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Because he's talking to the church here. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So so when pastor says that Jesus lives in your heart, that Jesus lives in you, he's not joking. Christ lives in us. I mean, if that's not another encouraging word for us tonight to help us get through our struggles and to help other people get through, I don't know what is. So even though your body would die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. And then I love this, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. That's why pastor was saying on Sunday, do you feel alive? Because, and that's what Ephesians 2 was about, being made alive in Christ. Are you alive in God? Do you feel God working in you? Do you feel the Holy Spirit working? Do you see a change in your life? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what he'll do in your life to help you overcome sin. I want you to know right now tonight, if you struggle with sin, I gotta tell you, Nothing that I've ever done has helped me overcome sin. Nothing that I have initiated or done. In other words, I have had to pray to the Holy Spirit and literally weep to him to say, help me overcome these sins. Help me overcome these struggles. Like, and I'm being serious. Um, I, could, I could like go to church every week. That's not going to change me. I could, I could go to my Bible and I can read it and I can sin right after I read it. I can continue in that habit right away. It's because we have to not go through the motions of Christianese or Christianity, right? And we have to go to God and get real with him and say, God, I cannot do this on my own. Set me free from this bondage. I've been on this health journey, right? And uh, so I've been trying to get healthier and stuff and just really focus on like making sure my body is a temple for God. 
And let me tell you something, eating only a thousand calories a day, it takes the Holy Spirit to do that. <laughs> it's crazy. But it's, it's wild because I consider it semi like a fast too because I, I think about the scriptures. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I think about, do I depend on uh, my physical needs for what only the spirit can give? And, and are, we, are we depending on physical habits like going to church to get rid of habitual spiritual sin? No, we can't do that. We have to go to God and say, Holy Spirit, I submit myself to what you're trying to do. So the next time I'm tempted, I say no. Because I know that that was you telling me not to eat that pancake <laughs> or whatever else. Whatever else you may struggle with. When the Holy Spirit's saying, that's not a good idea, and you justify and reason with him that it is a good idea, you're already in trouble. You know what I mean? You're already going to give in. So the Holy Spirit is at work in you in that way to help you and to sanctify you, to make you holy. Cool. So how is God doing this through his Holy Spirit? And uh, I want to get to uh, the bookends of grace. You see that hopefully in your uh, outline and as well as on the screen. Jerry Bridges, in his book, Growing Your Faith, by the way, we did a drawing tonight for this book, and Stephanie McClellan, you won this book, yeah. So come on up real quick and grab this. I like mixed it up. I think your name was on the bottom. I just kept shaking them up, stirring them up. Wow, well, there you go. That, that, you know what? It was meant to be that you get this book. Yep. So there you go. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we have books out there for you guys to purchase. We got a limited supply because, well, we don't want a huge inventory here at Calvary. But you can get a bunch on, you can get all these books online, even Kindle ones for cheaper if you want. But you can grab some books tonight uh, on your way out. So this book by Jerry Bridges is called Growing Your Faith, How to Mature in Christ. And it gives an analogy of how we grow because of being in the work of God and being in the grace of God. And so he gives the analogy of two bookends that hold books up on each side. So one bookend, he, this is what he says, the first bookend we need to set in place is the righteousness of Christ. The most important question any person can ask is, how can I, a sinful person, be accepted by an infinitely holy and righteous God? Well, Paul tells us the answer to that. He says, Paul tells us that it is by trusting in the righteousness of Christ. Philippians 3, 8 9, through 9 says this, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Now, what's the context of what Paul's saying there? Paul was the most faithful, zealous Pharisee around. He did everything to a T. If there was a Sabbath, he did zero work. If there was like, a, there's like there was like hundreds, or over a hundred rules added or more to, uh, to the law by the Jews, he followed every single one to a T. I mean, he was an expert in the law, the Apostle Paul. And what he's saying is, is all that work was worthless. None of that made me holy in God's sight. The only thing that made me holy, and pastor was saying this yesterday, that we cannot see God without holiness, right? Without holiness, we can't see God. Did you know that what pastor was saying there is, is that it's not what you do to be holy, it's what Jesus did to make you holy. The only thing we can do is receive that holiness and out of gratitude, what do we do? We live a holy life. We continue to live that holy life. So God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And Jerry goes on to say this, Paul found his acceptance, this is beautiful, 
He found his acceptance with God, not in his own imperfect, imperfect obedience, as impressive as it was, but by trusting in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, which God credits to all who trust in him as Savior. So Paul didn't find that God accepted him because he did everything perfectly. He found that he accepted him because of what Christ did for him. And that's so important for us to grasp moving forward. Because I think a lot of us, we sin one time and we're like, I got to get resaved now. I got to go to the altar. I'm in trouble. When I was a teenager, that was it. It was like, oh, I've sinned. When's the next youth group night so I can get saved? Who needs, to get, who needs to get their life to Christ? Ryan's raising his hand again. I didn't understand that it wasn't that what I did that saved me. And because I didn't understand that yet, uh, what I thought was that I had to live like a perfect life in order to remain saved. The Bible doesn't say to be remain saved. It just says to remain in God, to remain in me. My responsibility is not to remain saved. My responsibility is to hold on to faith in God to keep my faith in God, to continue in my belief in what Christ has done for me. Now, am I uh, teaching that I'm once saved, always saved teaching? Absolutely not. What I'm teaching though is, is that the condition is based on, do I continue to believe God or not? Because if I do believe in him, then I continue to understand that what he's done for me on the cross is, it means it's still there. It's still present in my life. That truth is there. So the second bookend that we must set in place is the power of Christ, which we already started covering. Jerry says this, too often we try to grow by our own willpower and self-discipline. We assume that if we read the Bible enough and pray enough, we will grow. We approach the Christian life much like a student approaches a difficult course in college. Just buckle down and try harder. That attitude assumes that we have the ability within ourselves to grow into maturity as believers. And that's really not the way we grow. So I'm not going to grow. So, so night three, we're going to talk about spiritual disciplines. And you have to understand something that you're not growing because of those disciplines. You're growing because of what Christ is doing as you do those disciplines. So it's, it's like this. Um, in order for me to get a haircut, I have to show up. And, God, and, and the person cuts my hair. In order for me to get my car worked on, I have to show up. And the car, I don't do it. I don't cut my own hair. Does it look like I cut my own hair? Maybe it does, I don't know. You can't see me working on my, my dad's right. We do not have car skills, okay? We can paint. I did learn how to do some painting. My brother's even better than me. My dad's really good. Um, we can do those things. But trust me, if I bring my car to a dealership, they're touching it, not me. But guess what? It gets worked on, doesn't it? We do have to submit ourselves to the work of Christ. And so we do have to participate. But what he's trying to say here is, is let Christ hold you up. If you're like a book, if your life is a book, let the work of Christ be on one side and the Holy Spirit, and really the Holy Spirit in, in the middle of it too, holding you up on the other side. In other words, we should succeed. If we trust this, we should succeed. We must depend in what Christ has done for us. So this is very good news because we aren't asked to live the Christ life without the power to do so. So God's not asking you or me to live the Christ life without the power to do so. So does this mean though that I get to like sit on the shelf and do nothing? No, it doesn't. So I wanna go into our last part here, the participation to grow. The participation to grow. So what's our role, the cooperation for us to grow? Colossians 2, six through seven says this, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So I want to look at this again. We have a condition there. It says you must continue to follow him. 
So when we lead someone to Christ, it's imperative that we encourage them to follow Jesus. It's imperative that we don't stop following Jesus once we got hell insurance. Once we got that, right? We got that payment to keep us out of hell. We got that money, that ransom that keeps us. No, we must continue to follow Christ. And then he even says this, let your roots grow down into him. We have to actually let ourselves sink in and trust in and build our lives in the truth of God's word in Jesus Christ. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. I love that side effect is that you will be thankful. Paul uses the analogy of roots in Colossians. Jesus uses the analogy of building a foundation on his teaching in Matthew 7. And Jesus, or John as well, uses the analogy of a vine and branches in John 15. And uh, I want to go to John 15, 1 through 8. John chapter 15, 1 through 8. There is a book by Andrew Murray called The True Vine. It's a 30-day devotional. I see eye to eye with him almost every single chapter except for one, except for one chapter. So I do recommend that book, but uh, I do not agree with him that uh, we can't walk away from God. There's too many scriptures in the Bible that warn us of the danger of that. Hebrews 3, 12 being a very important one. Can I just go ahead and put this scripture out there to you? And I think one of the things I've been teaching people with this debate of whether we can or not, I tell them this, why are you worried about it if you continue to follow Christ? (laughs) We should never really play or flirt with that line of not being okay and being okay. We should stay off the fence. Hebrews 3, verse 12 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. Again, so your salvation is not secure because of you remain saved. Your salvation is secure, one, because of what Christ did for you, but then your cooperation of believing in him, of remaining faithful and true to him turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today. In other words, the day of grace, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Wow. In other words, we can be deceived by sin and have an unbelieving heart and turn away from God. That scripture is very hard to refute because he's talking to the church. He's not talking to unsaved people. And so I just want you to know that Uh, remaining in Christ is so important but you don't have to be afraid every day that you've lost your salvation you don't have to do that if you've walked away from God it means that you have completely disbelieved everything about him it means that you have turned your heart away from him by not believing anything that he's done for you on the cross your life shows it the fruit of your life says you disobey him every day all the time 1 John talks about that a lot that the mark of a person, so to say, who is not in Christ is someone who lives in habitual sin nonstop. There's a difference between slipping up in sin and there's a difference between willingly and habitually pursuing sin. There's a major difference in the Bible when it comes to that. But let's get to John 15 because you'll see some themes in here too about the importance of remaining in Christ. I am the, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Did you see that? Did you read it? Listen to this again. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. Did you know that God actually prunes and disciplines those he loves? You know what he does? He, he comes around every once in a while and he humbles us. 
because we may grow in um, patience, but the other stem is kindness. And by the way, those really kind of coincide together. (laughs) But what about self-control? We may grow in self-control and become dependent on the fact that, hey, I have a lot of self-control, but then we're not patient with someone. He's always trying to grow us and discipline us, so he'll keep us humble. And so instead of us dependent on our good works, he's wanting us to be dependent on his help and his spirit working in us. So there are times in our lives where God is going to actually uh, prune you back, so to say. He's going to work on you so that you don't become boastful in you and what you've done and what you've accomplished. By the way, you know, that, you know how it goes, right? If you pray for patience, something bad's going to happen that week, right? I don't pray for patience anymore. No, sorry. <laughs> so let me keep going. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So he's talking about growth. You can't grow the character of Christ in you. You can't grow the qualities of of Christ and the Spirit if you don't remain in Jesus. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's scary to think about. I know there's times in my life where I've tried to accomplish something and it didn't work and I can look back and go, I know why. I did that on my own intuition and creativity. I did that on my own power. I didn't do, I didn't do that with Christ. I was trying to do that all on my own. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Dependence on Jesus, in other words, is vital for our growth and bearing fruit. And I wish we could do a deeper study on this. I do really like Andrew Murray's book, The True Vine. You'll find a lot of awesome insight into that uh, to help you grow. But uh, let me give you a few nuggets from his book uh, going through that. But here's who we have in the story. This is a parable, and God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. But what isn't given in this story but is implied is the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the Spirit of God is? He's a life-giving sap that flows through the vines. And so we don't have that literally in there, but when you start to learn the agricultural work of vines, there's life-giving sap that goes from the vine all the way to the branches. And so the author, Andrew Murray, says that the Holy Spirit is like the sap. So we have Jesus, our source of life. We have God, the creator of all things, as our caretaker, our gardener. And we have the life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit all working on our behalf if we simply stay connected to him. I mean, you have God, the perfect God, helping you, taking care of your life pruning you, disciplining you, helping you grow, putting you in situations that are going to help you grow. I'm meant to tell you this tonight too. I'm not trying to jump to tomorrow night, but I got to tell you something. One of the ways that God grows us is through adversity. And one of the things we always try to get out of is adversity and conflict and struggles. But the reality is it takes a struggle to actually get anything done. It takes work to get anything done. It takes conflict and and getting through tough situations. And and some of you are like, okay, I've had enough though, God. I can't do it. What are you trying to make me? A ruby? Like a perfect diamond? Like I can't handle the fire anymore. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. It's brutal. But looking back, I go, wow, I've grown a lot wow, I've matured a lot. I've matured and grown to the point that I can help other people that go through the same thing. 
This is why, according to Scripture, we will bear fruit, because we have God working on our behalf like this. We will mature, grow, and produce fruit that is even meant to bless others, but it's all contingent on, though, whether we abide or remain in Christ. And this is a daily challenge. How do, how do we remain in Christ? Well, every day that I hang out with God by reading the Bible or praying or talking to Him or obeying the Scriptures and applying them, I'm living and remaining in Christ. Every day that I respond to the Holy Spirit that says, go pray for that person, go help that person, don't look at that, don't touch that, do that, I'm remaining in Christ. That's how we remain in Him. This is why as pastors, or even as spiritual mentors in this room, when we ask people how their personal time is in the Word of God and in prayer, or being with other believers, it's actually a really important question that we're asking. I have found that many of my answers I would get answered in counseling have been found in my time with God. I have found that many things that I find help in is not away from the church, but with the body of Christ, because they have answers for me. I have found that the encouragement and the love that I need is found in my brothers and sisters surrounding me. All these things we should not neglect, we should actually pursue when we're struggling. So Andrew Murray says this to us as branches. You have but one thing to do, only be a branch. Nothing more, nothing less. Just be a branch. Christ will be the vine that gives all, and the gardener, the mighty God who made the vine what it is, will as surely make the branch what it ought to be. In other words, God is going to do what he planned to do in your life. He's going to complete it as we remain in him. And going back to the goal of our growth, which is Jesus Christ, Andrew Murray says this, the branch has but one object for which it exists, one purpose to which it is entirely given up. That purpose is to bear the fruit the vine wishes to bring forth. Think about it. If I have an orange tree and the branch is attached to that vine and that root, what's going to come out of it? An orange. If the branch stays connected, an orange is going to eventually come forth, right? If we remain connected to Christ, we will grow and become more like Him. And I'm going to say something kind of heavy, but I'm doing this out of love. This can only mean one thing then. If we are not becoming and behaving more like Christ in our thoughts and our actions, then we're probably not truly connected to Jesus. The result of being connected to Jesus is a new life. You're a new creation and you grow and you mature and you begin to speak and talk and act like Jesus. And so a sure sign for all of us, that's why the Bible says, if you want to know false prof prophets, you will see them by their fruit, right? You will know them by their fruit. We can also know that someone isn't doing well if their life isn't looking like Christ. And that's when my care meter goes on, my care radar, you know? And I'm like, hey, are you okay? Because what you're saying there, you know, what you're upset about, it's not of Christ. What you're struggling with, and, and I know it takes time to get through some things, but I just want you to know you got victory in Christ. Jesus did not want you to remain on that branch and be fruitless. He, you know, he didn't want you to be a branch that was fruitless and, and withering and struggling. If we're connected to Christ, there's only one thing that can happen, and that's growth. It's being transformed. There's only one purpose for us here on this earth is to let Christ pour into us. But why? This really hit me hard when I read this in this book. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, if I stay close to Christ, I get to grow. Yes. Right? I've arrived. I've done my part. I'm, I'm, I have fruit. The fruit of Christ. Andrew Murray convicts me so bad when he says this. Why? Why would we want to? The reason is very simple. 
they do not know that fruit bearing is the one thing they have been saved for. Just as entirely as Christ became the true vine with the one object, you have been made a branch too with the one object of bearing fruit for the salvation of men. Wow. Why are we supposed to grow? It's true. To help this, help other people, help mankind be saved. It, I mean, think about that for a second. What good is it to have a house full of fruit and do nothing with it? It's going to spoil. What good is it to continue to grow the character of Christ and you don't even give it out? It would be like people walking by your house and seeing apples rot on the tree and falling to the ground when there's poor people all around that could use it. If you recall my analogy with the water bottles one Sunday morning during the So All May Know series, I had a five packs of waters up there, plenty of water for everyone. Being stingy is an example of what Christ has poured into me. We don't have to do that. The reason why God is growing you is so that you can help other people meet Christ. That's the end game. Why is that? Because that's what Christ did and we're becoming like Christ. Romans 8, 29, the goal is to become more like Christ. So we're supposed to look like Him, act like Him, live like Him. So you know what? My growth, there's, there's lives on the line with my growth. Starting with my kids. Starting with my children. My children's lives are on the line based on whether I take care of my Christian walk, my spiritual walk or not. Because here's the thing. Will my kids find that I'm a jerk, find that I'm mean, ruthless, heartless, ungracious, just completely mean and hateful? Or are they going to find Christ through me? And so when they read the Bible one day and read Jesus, they're like, oh, I know this person. I watched this person live through my dad. I watched Jesus work through my dad. I want to follow Jesus too because I enjoy that person. I enjoy Jesus Christ. You see how vital it is that we grow? I'm praying tonight. I've been praying tonight uh, for tonight. I've been praying that there's probably many different reasons why you may need to respond during this worship. One could be that you need to give your life to Christ. And so we have plenty of leaders around here, plenty of people. In fact, if you don't mind, just um, if you're on the prayer team, raise your hand right now just to help me out. If you're a community group leader, raise your hand. Okay, nice and high. If you're one of the young adult leaders, raise your hand as well. Pastors, we have plenty of people here that you can go to. We have board members here that if you need Jesus Christ, you understand now that he's died for you that he took on the work, the, the cross for you and now you simply must believe and now follow him then please see one of them tonight to pray together and maybe you're in here and you're like I'm just super grateful now for what I heard tonight I'm just so grateful you know I'm just so grateful for what God is doing and so maybe your worship will be different tonight and then maybe maybe you realize you know what I need to apply myself to be connected and remain in the vine and stay connected to Christ so that I will grow. I have not been pursuing Christ. I've been busy with everything else and I need to pursue Christ. So I'm not going to really orchestrate what you should do tonight, but these altars are open right now for us to worship together, for us to pray for one another, and uh, for, for God to move on your hearts. And, and we have 20 minutes. So I want to pray jump in and worship and do as you feel you need. So I'll stay up here and some of our pastors can come down here as well to pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. God, we pray that you would do a spiritual work in this room tonight. Now that we've learned that we need to grow, why we grow, how we can grow, 
pray, God, that your spirit would move and encourage, fix and repair. May we rest in what you've done for us. May we depend on you for that growth. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring even 